All right, it, it's, uh, it's been great fun to be here, and I'll try to give you 15 minutes of light entertainment. So uh, I'm talking about uh, a technical use of the word monster and the, its connection with the string landscape as I see it developing in the next few years. Uh, in honor of the release of The Hobbit, I have a picture of one of Tolkien's monsters here. Um, so, so more seriously, I'm gonna talk about monstrous moonshine uh, and how it might impact eventually our understanding of uh, the so-called string landscape. Now, uh, thankfully, many of you here are not string theorists, and so I will define my terms, and that will actually take me through 90% of the talk. <laughs> so string theory, uh, okay, you all know what string theory is in some sense. It's, it's known to have a, a very large set of solutions to its equations of motion and some approximation. And this collection of solutions, we could debate the precise nature of it, but we'll call it the string landscape, which is the name it's come to be called by. Now, there's a common ingredient in the simplest, uh, simplest might be the wrong word, the most studied by string theorists set of solutions, uh, which are the ones that give space-time supersymmetry, the simplest examples, n equals eight or n equals four, uh, and then n equals two and so forth. And, and the ingredients are, are these, uh, these special geometries called calabi yau manifolds. These are the names of mathematicians who conjecture they exist and then prove that they exist. And these spaces are special not for magical reasons. It's because in Einstein's theory, a vacuum solution ought to be Ricci flat. And these spaces were proved to admit Ricci flat metrics and so solve the vacuum Einstein equations. And furthermore, in technical terms, they admit killing spinners. Uh, so they preserve, and in parentheses, a lot of supersymmetry, enough so that if you make some approximate statement, it can be promoted to one that's exact with some confidence. Okay, now there's a rich set of known topologies for such spaces in the first papers that discussed them. It's really inspiring reading. They thought there might be four, and so if you just find a fifth one with the right properties, maybe you could find the theory of everything. Okay, so in fact, there are, there are known to be many, many topologies, so it's not gonna be that simple. Um, but this is not really the source of the richness of, of what people call the, the string landscape. Uh, it gets a large boost in its degeneracy because these spaces themselves, the many thousands of such spaces, are topologically complicated. This is a picture of a slice of one, and you can see even the slice has many holes and handles. And so if you have generalized magnetic fields in your theory, which, for instance, um, well, string theory does, you can thread these cycles with fluxes of the magnetic field. Okay, and so here's a, a picture. Now it's been simplified to a picture of a Riemann surface that should represent the calabi -Yau. And along the handles, there could be fluxes. Uh, Joe provided us with D-brains. We could throw some of those in and wrap the cycles. In this way, you combinatorially generate large sets of at least uh, possible solutions, and then you have to evaluate to what extent they solve your equations of motion. But the, the current belief anyway, which is a well-controlled belief in, in some small set of cases, is that these give ex some exponentially large vacuum degeneracy. Now, many, maybe most, certainly at Stanford most, uh, of the discussions of this set of vacua have focused on very difficult issue, issues of cosmology, but very interesting issues of cosmology. We heard some of this earlier today, uh, in a large set of metastable vacua of the sort that breaks supersymmetry. In my talk, I'm gonna take a step back and set up a more formal question, maybe less ambitious, but still involving things that I think will take us 50 years into the future without total resolution. Uh, even without the fluxes, there are many calabi spaces. Now I'm gonna give you an example of something nice that happened that I'd like to see repeated here. Okay, so even without the fluxes, there are many calabi spaces. But we understood in the late 90s that instead of looking at this large list and throwing up our hands in bewilderment, uh, they're unified in a very deep sense. Okay, for instance, uh, these spaces may differ locally by taking part of the topology and crunching it down and maybe resolving the singularity you create that way in a different way that still preserves the calabi condition. Here's a, a picture of one such process called the conifold. And the very su supersymmetric space-time theories that string theory on these calabi spaces gives you have scalar moduli that have no potential because of the supersymmetry. They have V equals zero. And these moduli actually enact as you move through different branches of the moduli space, these kinds of topological transitions. And so in a cartoon using Riemann surfaces, it's as if in string theory you could start on this topology and go through some physically smooth regular processes and end up over here. And so where you might have thought there was a large set of uh, you know, widely disconnected choices you have to make, in fact, there's a large unified space. Uh, the detailed mathematical structure of the space of these calabias and how they connect together in this little toy model, no fluxes, a lot of supersymmetry, uh, realizes something a mathematician called Reed conjectured. It's called Reed's fantasy. Reed was fantasizing about connections between symplectic calabias. And uh, 
I think that this, this detailed mathematical structure matters a lot for the big picture. The big picture isn't uh, one choice out of a large list of topologies. It's a unified space on which one can imagine dynamics or unifying principles. Okay, now that's a, a toy model. We are very far, at least as far as I can tell, from knowing some kind of deep underlying mathematical structure that would help you know, unravel the physics of what's been implicitly discussed in many of this morning's talks, uh, this set of nested bubbles within bubbles from vacuum decays in some eternally inflating space time with positive cosmological constant. Okay? In, in vacuum without supersymmetry, you know, metastability will be the rule, there will be tunneling, and, and so there's some picture like this. Now, we don't have a precise mathematical formulation of this. I think it is a radically conservative picture under some set of assumptions you're led here. So I don't think it's, it's something we don't have to think about. Um, but I would like to take a step back and say, uh, can we find some intermediate uh, Goldilocks case where there's still a rich mathematical structure that we can unearth? Okay, and the best understood vacua that are intermediate between what we already have a nice picture of and this, this kind of complicated picture uh, or flux vacuo that happen to still be supersymmetric. These still occur in exponentially large numbers. Uh, they can constitute a sort of spherical cow for this problem. And so can we find some principles that help to organize these? Now, new ideas for this kind of thing have to come out of left field. And in string theory, it's historically been true that deep mathematics usually has good interplay with the things that turn out to be physically true in simple cases. Okay, so in this case, uh, the, the left field where I see something maybe emerging uh, is in the study of something called monstrous moonshine that was first uncovered in the 1980s. Okay, so what is monstrous moonshine? Well, by the end of the last century, mathematicians closed in on the classification of the finite simple groups. These are, you, you know, generalized symmetries that you could imagine acting on the Hilbert space, the quantum mechanical Hilbert space of some physical system. And they found that in addition to a large number of infinite families, 18 infinite families, there were 26 oddballs. This is coincidentally the critical dimension for the bosonic string. But anyway, there are 26 oddballs. And uh, the biggest of these uh, is the fischer grease monster. Its order is 8 times 10 to the 53. But there's some nice web of them, a lot of them unified in this monstrous structure. Okay. And moonshine uh, was actually a mathematical observation with no physical content at first relating uh, these sort of deep and, and uh, oddball structures in group theory to another very interesting and rich part of mathematics. Okay, so another part of mathematics, divorced from what we've been talking about, is the study of modular functions and modular forms. These are objects that have the following property. It's natural for many reasons to consider functions that are holomorphic and, and that map uh, the upper half plane to the complex numbers. Okay, so they're functions of tau, where tau takes values in the, the complex upper half plane. Uh, but these modular forms or functions have a special property. If you map tau to a tau plus b over c tau plus d, that's an SL2z transformation. a, b, and c, d should be integers with a, d minus b, c equal to 1. The function transforms in a nice covariant way. In the simplest case, it just comes back to itself uh, when the weight is 0. Now, why do such functions show up in string theory? Well, for two reasons. One is space-time effective actions in theories that enjoy S-duality symmetry, a symmetry that has this action on some modulus field like the dilaton, uh, well, the, the terms in the effective action will then be modular forms or modular invariant. Another reason is that in string theory at one loop, where you might try to compute the partition function that counts physical states, uh, a torus itself has a complex structure tau. Tau is only defined up to such transformations, and so one-loop amplitudes satisfy this kind of property, and one-loop string theory generates modular forms. Okay. But in any case, these forms and functions are very interesting to mathematicians because they arise in number theory, where the highly constrained properties of modularity let you prove interesting theorems using the modular property. And it's conventional to define them by a Q expansion. You set Q to e to the i tau, so it's automatically periodic under tau goes to tau plus 1, which is one of these symmetries. And then you just Taylor expand. And that gives you some coefficients, Cn. The original observation of monstrous moonshine is that these coefficients, Cn, for the simplest, most basic modular function, the J function, are controlled by dimensions of irreducible representations of this group from a totally different part of mathematics, the monster, the unique, largest uh, finite group, simple finite group. Now, this was actually explained by string theory. 
In string theory, as I said, the string partition function at one loop that counts physical states mass level by mass level, the q to the n term counts string states at mass level n, is a modular form. And there's a very peculiar string, bosonic strings on the Leech lattice. It's a 24-dimensional lattice that, that um, codifies the way you can most densely pack oranges in 24 dimensions. Anyway, you put strings on this lattice at some kind of complex torus, uh, and you'll find that, well, if you compute the partition function, you get the simplest modular function, the J function. And if you look at the symmetries of the conformal field theory that describes string propagation, you find, in fact, a monster symmetry. So the reason that the monster and the J function are related physically is that there is a physical theory with monster symmetry whose partition function is the J function. Okay, and this is an example of, of moonshine, which is some peculiar way that the string relates the monster group to the most basic modular function. Now, this is a beautiful thing. Uh, it resulted in Fields medals. It was very prominent for a time. But it's fair to say that this particular string theory has played no role in what came afterwards. And so it seemed like a peculiarity off in the corner, uh, not related to things that we really care about. Here's a recent generalization from 2010 by Iguchi et al. The, the story goes that Iguchi was looking for this generalization for 22 years. Anyway, he found it, along with Oguri and Tachikawa, two of his students. They study type 2 strings on K3. K3 is, is sort of the opposite of this leech lattice. It's been the sort of testing ground, the test bed, for many of our simplest and most profound ideas about string theory. It preserves a lot of supersymmetry. It's the simplest non-trivial example of a Calabi-Yau space. And so string dualities show up there. Black hole entropy was counted there, so on and so forth. What they did is see that not the partition function of strings on K3, um, but a natural modular form that, that counts not all physical states, but those that preserve some fraction of supersymmetry, these states called BPS states, that that modular form, uh, called the elliptic genus, enjoys a similar relationship for this much more interesting string theory uh, to one of these objects. In fact, they found that the group uh, Methu 24 here, two steps from the monster, gives rise to some natural module uh, and the dimensions of the vector spaces there control the Q expansion of this elliptic genus or the numbers of BPS states on K3. Now, this data specifying BPS states is related in more generic calabi yau models to the same kinds of data. Here, here I'll be quite vague, but I have five years to make this precise. Uh, the same kinds of data specifying a flux vacuum. For instance, D-brains wrapping some homology class of curves or divisors. Okay. So I'd like to vaguely conjecture, and I could be a little less vague than this, that in some cases, at least, the degeneracies counted by special modular forms that arise in roughly this kind of context also control counting of special supersymmetric flux vacua. And these very large numbers aren't, oh, there's 10 to the n, where n is some big number. They're a precise number, and that number matters, and it's related to number theory. Now, um, I have one minute left to describe what I've actually been doing or plan to do over the next five years. Okay, so I have lots of collaborators, which is always a good start. Uh, there's a, a group of students and postdocs here, some mathematicians elsewhere, Miranda Chang, uh, John Duncan, Jeff Harvey, who's sort of the mathematician. And so with these people, uh, what I've done is take this EOT observation, and we're trying to run with it in a few ways, but I think the, the best spirit would be to say, we're hoping that unlike the case with the Leach lattice, this is an indicator of a rich structure that extends to many spaces, many strings, uh, many of the groups, and many modular forms. Okay. So, um, what we've been doing is trying to generalize this observation using different observations in different cases to examples with some amount of supersymmetry that gives us confidence that we can count things. Uh, significant ingredients in what we're doing include dualities between heterotic and type 2 strings. So if we start with heterotic strings on K3, we can dualize them over to calabi yau compactifications and enter this rich web I talked about in the first half of my talk. Uh, this duality relates interesting mathematical objects on one side, these modular elliptic genera, uh, to gromov witten invariance, another interesting enumerative geometric object. Uh, and also, we've been finding some novel facts about elliptic genera of calabi yau fourfolds that could be used in something called F-theory that Kummerin invented to also compactify strings to four dimensions. Very large subgroups of the monster, not quite the monster itself yet, but things like the Conway group uh, here, sort of demoted by one level from our friend, do show up in very suggestive ways but not in ways that we can make precise enough to state a conjecture that a mathematician would parse. So we're still working on making a precise conjecture, but my, my belief is in the next few years, we'll see a very rich web of moonshine relations between modular forms, these interesting geometries, Calabi-Yau geometries, uh, and these very special groups. And so 
What does it have to do with physics? Well, maybe it's classifying and giving us some structure on the simplest avatars of this picture. Okay. Uh, or if not, at least it's math. Thank you. Do you have any speculations, which might take 10 or more years to realize, about what the um, generalization of these structures could be to threefolds? Not really. So um, I've had some interesting discussions with Yao. So you probably know much more about this than me, but, but there's a sense in which large parts of math in the last century were involved the study of elliptic curves and the study of solutions of equations defining elliptic curves over finite fields. Uh, and of course, the relationship between counting those solutions and modular forms is probably the most famous theorem of the last century, the modularity theorem. Um, it, for various reasons, one might think the natural generalization of the elliptic curve for algebraic geometry in the next century uh, will be the Calabi-Yau twofold and the Calabi-Yau threefold. Uh, we certainly know that counting problems associated with calabi have been interesting. They, they, they solve gauge theories. They count black hole entropies. Um, so a vague but sort of a positive sounding thing I can say is that special properties of, of, of these counting functions may be over finite fields, and I don't quite know what the, the physical reason for that would be. Certainly it's not a normal space time. Maybe that's related to emergence of space time. But I, I think counting functions of calabi may be over interesting fields, maybe the sort of uh, next century's analog of the elliptic curve. So in the case of the monster, there was a string theory that had this as a symmetry. So in the other case, do you expect to have this, a string theory? Yeah, this is a fabulous question. In the case of the K3 conformal field theory, uh, it's been proved that if you consider type two strings on K3, the statement in conformal field theory language would be, if you consider four comma four sigma models with K3 target, it is a theorem that there is no such theory that has M24 as a symmetry, okay? Uh, there is a much larger context in which, for reasons that I can't explain fully here now, uh, you would get the same kind of elliptic genus as the four, four sigma model. These would be heterotic strings on K3 and zero, four sigma models. The symmetries in that context aren't classified, okay? And it's a much harder problem to classify the symmetries. It's quite conceivable that there is a literal zero, four conformal field theory with M24 symmetry that, that explains this observation, um, but I don't have any very strong evidence in favor of that statement. So this is not yet on the level of of, of the, uh, the monstrous moonshine. And also here we're just talking about the elliptic genus, not the full partition function. So it's kind of related to this. In the, if you compactify bosonic string on, on the two toros, there's a point where the, you can continue the question from the slide. You know where I'm heading? Oh, <laughs> there's a point in the modular space with an SU3 symmetry and there's another point with an SO4 symmetry. So people said, well, we just have to look for a group that unifies the two of them and that would be the symmetry group of string field theory or something. Do you envision something like this here? I actually view that, that precise program that you mentioned as one that didn't succeed. Yeah. And uh, my hope would be that whatever comes out of this, uh, it's going to be more interesting than that. The main evidence in favor of that isn't yet physical. The main evidence in favor of that is that the math involved feels very good and doesn't feel like the question that you just asked. But I could be wrong. Just one remark uh, about this uh, monster, Monshine. Yeah, there was a con conjecture of Hirzebrook that should be 24 dimensional manifolds with fundamental group monster, such as elliptic genus, you get exactly all representation. Yeah, and I had a f for several years a conjecture how that this 24 dimensional manifolds, it's kind of naturally kind of, uh, comes from K3 surfaces. I can explain to you later. Yeah, so that sounds very interesting. Yeah, I can. Because even for, for, for four yeah. folds and six folds, we're seeing interesting properties in the yeah. genera. Any further questions? If not, then thanks again, Mr. Speaker. <laughs>